alcohols. Alcohols is actually an important class of organic compounds. And most importantly, on top of anything else, they tell you very important use of alcohols that they are going to be extremely useful solvent. So anywhere, if you talk about any alcohols, the first use you can come up with is that they are used as solvent. Be it perfumes, deodorants, body sprays, name a kind of a perfume or in any form it is used, definitely the base of the solvent would be an alcohol. Even the hand sanitizers are based on alcohol. So let's get started. As soon as we refer to the name alcohol, we are actually talking about the members of a very large family, or to be honest, the proper word homologous series. So this homologous series would have the functional group OH bonded to them. All right. So if you start off with the smallest of branches, CH3 is the smallest branch in organic chemistry. So if you bond OH to it, it's the very first and uh, we, you can say one of the smallest al alcohols in the world. Then increase the branch number, and there you go, you have another alcohol. Increase the branch number more, add another CH2 in the line, you have another alcohol, and keep moving with the same practice, and you have, start having different alcohols. So that's how we get alcohol. So, this one is the first alcohol, second, third, so on and so forth. The familiar alcohol, the alcohol we usually use in drinks, is C2H5OH. Which one is this? This is actually this one. This one is sometimes written as, take a look, two carbon atoms, so C2, three plus two, five hydrogen, H5OH, and that's why it's written like this over here, right? You may write it like this, you may write it like this. It's entirely up to you. This is known as ethanol. Ethanol is the actual name, which brings us to the method, how we need to name it. So let's move on to the next page and let's learn how to name it. <clears throat> so drawing and naming the alcohol. The first four alcohols are the simplest ones and they are actually a part of your course. They are not going to go with higher alcohols in your course. So it's good enough if you go with first four or maybe five alcohols as per your book. So the first one, <coughs> as I told you, is CH3OH. That's how it is drawn. If you combine all the hydrogen atoms, the molecular formula would be CH4O. That's why we usually come up with CNH2NO. This is what is being followed in all of the formulas right here. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Made a small mistake. Just let me clarify the mistake. It's actually seen it's two n plus two o, right? So that's being followed over here. Take the number of carbon atoms, double it, add two to it, and then write o after. So one carbon atom, doubling it two uh, atoms and then adding two more to it, four hydrogen atoms, and then you have the oxygen. Oxygen always six to one. Two carbon atoms, doubling it, four, adding two to it, six hydrogen atoms. That's how you get the number of hydrogen atoms and then oxygen. So on and so forth, you can go for the same practice to find out the molecular formula of your alcohol. When we talk about names, there actually is a technique to separate the names. Now, take a look at this structure. This was what, this was the branch. Since it has one carbon, it was meth. Since it is singly bonded, it is represented with ane, but we don't write the last E. And this functional group actually is alcohol, so it is represented with ol. So that's how we name it, methanol. Methanol. This name can be divided into three parts. Math means one carbon atom. N means it's singly bonded. O means it is connected to an alcohol group. If you write the next name, ethanol, it's gonna mean the same thing and you would know. So S means two carbon atoms. N means they're singly bonded. And O means they're connected to an alcohol functional group. Starting from the third one, you'd also notice numbering, which means 
the alcohol group can be attached either way. So what does this propanol mean? Let's clarify it. Let's erase all of this from here. I'm gonna use this space. So there are two ways of doing it. You can write it as propen one o or you may come up with another variant that is propen 2 o <clears throat> Since I've already told you how to work the name out in the form of a structure, so we're gonna do that. This is actually a backward technique. So prop means three carbon atoms. N means they're all singly bonded. All represent specifically OH. One represents it's connected to the first carbon. So start numbering them one, two, three. You are supposed to put this one up here and then H. And there you go. Put up the hydrogen atoms and there you have the entire structure. Now, this is gonna be a little different for this technique. So prop means three carbon atoms. So that's, there you go, you have the three carbon atoms. N means they're singly bonded. So I'm gonna put single bonds in between them. O means it has OH connected. Two means the OH is connected to second carbon atom. So start numbering from any side, this does not matter which numbering you started, which side you started from. Two means OH is connected to this side, so O and H. You may write the OH together, it's entirely up to you, but since we go with the displayed formula and every atom and every bond is supposed to be displayed in a displayed formula, so we are actually displaying it as a separate O and A separately and not together. So for the rest of it, keep putting on the line, keep filling it up with hydrogen atoms so that you can balance the valency or the combining power of every carbon atom. Remember, every carbon atom can make a total of four single covalent bonds. So that's what you have done over here. That's how you get propen 2 o In a similar way, you can have butane one o and butane 2 o one o means it's connected to first carbon atom. 2 o means that this won't be like this. You have, will have a hydrogen over here, but you might have an OH over here. This would then be, this kind of structure would then be butane 2 o I hope that makes sense. So <clears throat> remember the hint, the slate formula means you can't write O and H together. You're supposed to show the bond sign in between them. And you'll find the same thing over here or here or here. So the slate formula means remember the rule, all the atoms and all the bonds. You can't skip a bond in between. And that's why this hint has been given right here at the bottom. Moving on, this explains the naming and the structures. So meth, it, prop, butte are the number of carbon atoms. N tells you that it's saturated and there are single bonds only. O tells you that the O is functional group. So it's the same thing I've been telling you all along. All right? They have used the word saturated. Remember, saturated means single bonds only. Remember the term saturated was for single bond and unsaturated was the word that we used for either a double bond or a triple bond present in the structure. So what if number one is a different number? So of course you can have propen 2 o or you can have butane 2 o but you can't have propen 3 o or butane 3 o That's not possible. Yeah, that might be possible for pentane. Pentane would, may, would exist in pentane 1O. It would also exist in the form of pentane 2O. And in this specific case, though that, that does not happen in propen or butane, but that can happen in pentane in case of pentane 3O. However, General names propanol and butanol are also acceptable to be used in exam. So if you're just referring to a, an alcohol which has three carbon atoms and you're not actually specifying the position of the functional group, you may use the word propanol. 
you may use the word butanol if you are referring to an alcohol with four carbon atoms without specifying the position. So yeah, all of them can be combined into a single word, fentanyl. When you're writing fentanyl, you, you're trying to tell the examiner that you're talking about an alcohol with five carbon atoms and you are specifically not representing the position. So in generic questions, yeah, they are acceptable. But just in generic questions, that does not mean that if he is talking about an isomer or an exact position, he keep on using the generic term, all right? The generic terms are only acceptable with generic questions. Moving on, the reactions for ethanol, the first one we're gonna begin with is oxidation. Remember, we are already done with combustion of ethanol, all right? That was a part of the introduction to organic chemistry chapter, combustion of ethanol or combustion of alcohols was something that we did back over there. So they haven't repeated it over here, right? Oh, actually <laughs> that has been repeated over there. Okay, I thought they are gonna go with oxidation of alcohols in some other manner, but yeah, they are actually burning it out. So yes, you are gonna burn it up in oxygen. You're gonna get carbon dioxide in water. It's a fuel from biological sources. You may get it from uh, fermenting sugarcane or corn, maybe some fruit juices or some other kind of seed juices. Yeah, mixtures of petrol with ethanol are increasingly used in countries such as Brazil, where they have little or no oil industry to produce their own petrol. So what do they do? They take a little bit of petrol, they buy actually petrol from different other countries, and then they mix ethanol with it since they have a lot of ethanol available. Since it's a pretty green country and it's, uh, they're very really good with their ethanol prices. So <coughs> they often have a climate which is really good for growing sugarcane. So they go for biofuels. Biofuels actually. Uh, depend upon ethanol, they reduce the dependence on fossil fuels, which are finite and non renewable resources. On the other hand, sugarcane is a potentially renewable resource. How? Just plant it every year and you'll renew it. Corn is also a potentially renewable resource. Plant it every year and you can have corn every year. So, yeah, these are not non renewable resources all the fossil fuels were. So yes, that is one of <coughs> an advantages over the other, but that's still a debate, whether you can do it or not. Brazil has to do it because they have their own problems, but for the countries in which the petrol prices are cheaper, using a food source won't be a good idea. For example, if I talk about the Arab countries, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and I can list a few more, they actually have lower petrol or gasoline prices and somewhat higher food prices. So it won't be possible for them to grow sugarcane all around and go for ethanol because they have uh, so much of this gasoline or petrol. So yeah, it's understandable if they go otherwise, right? Moving on. <coughs> ethanol can be oxidized in other manners. The one that I, I was just considering about. So yeah, you can oxidize ethanol and that happens in the air because of the presence of microbe, microbes of bacteria. We also call it microbial oxidation. Let me tell you, there is another name. We call it biological oxidation. <coughs> Sorry. So biological oxidation. And that actually occurs naturally. A bottle of wine left open to air turns sour. The French for sour wine is vinaigre, so it was distorted into vinegar, and that's how we started using vinegar. Actually, vinegar was being used way before than, than this word, but yeah, we use this word because of that. So ethanol in the wine is oxidized by air with the help of microorganisms, such as bacteria or yeast, and they convert ethanol into ethanoic acid by simply adding a few oxygen atoms. So you can use it like this, all right? If you balance it like this, you might need to take a couple of water molecules, a water molecule lab. So 
What you can do is that we usually don't do that. Or that we simply convert it into this. What do we do? We write the word microbial oxidation over here. That's how we balance the whole equation. That it's microbial oxidation. So yeah, the microbes were capable of giving some oxygen to it, and it was converted from ethanol to ethanoic acid. The old name for ethanoic acid was acetic acid. This name is still used in papers. So that's why this is written over here. Moving on, ethanols can be oxidized by heating with good oxidizing agents. This specific step is known as chemical oxidation. So yeah, you have biological oxidation or you have microbial oxidation and then you have chemical oxidation. How can you oxidize it? Oxidizing ethanol or other alcohols in the lab is possible. You can use an oxidizing agent, a mixture of potassium dichromate 6 and dilute sulfuric acid. Potassium dichromate 6 is a very strong oxidizing agent. It has the formula K2Cr2O7. Now, dilute sulfuric acid is important for the potassium dichromate to act as an oxidizing agent. It's actually more like a starter. Without the H positive ions from the acid, no redox reaction is going to occur. So a few drops of alcohol uh, ethanol is added to a solution. And this specific one has a yellow color. Though it has an orange appearance, but in dilute solution, it comes as yellow. Now this yellow color is gonna be converted into green as soon as the reaction completes. So the tube is heated in a hot uh, uh, water bath. With a little bit of heat, the reaction proceeds. And this oxidizing agent can actually oxidize the alcohol into vinegar, ethanol, in this case, ethanol into vinegar. <coughs> All right. Safety note, wear eye protection, add the reactions very slowly. Don't go for a two volume reaction because if you're gonna add them in bigger amounts, it is gonna, definitely gonna turn up as a volume reaction. Do not point the mouth of the test tube towards you or maybe any of your friends, the contents may spit out. They may jump right out of it and with really some force. So we call it spitting out. So avoid spitting uh, towards you or towards any of your friends, all right? So extension work, potassium dichromate six. The word diamine tells you that there are two chromium atoms in the compound as you can also see in the formula. The Roman numeral six shows that the oxidation state of chromium, CR specifically, is plus six. We have done this in chapter seven before. This means this is a transition element. Di tells us how many of these atoms are present in the formula. Six tells us what is the oxidation state of it in the formula. So these are the ions that are responsible for it. How do they convert it, uh, one component into the other? That's not a part of GCSE. We usually cater that at A level, all right? Moving on. So how do we carry out the whole thing? We take this alcohol ethanol. We simply write that this oxidizing agent is capable of giving it to oxygen, and hence this in this the equation I, that I previously wrote. And they're actually putting these oxygens as red figures so you would know how oxygens bind with one of the carbon atoms in there and pushes both of the hydrogen atoms out to form water. So the starting material are ethanol, potassium dichromate, dilute sulfuric acid, conditions, you heat them under reflux. What is reflux? You take all of this in the flask, you have a reflux condenser in which cold water goes in and out. Actually, this should be towards this side. Cold water is going in, not going out, All right? So that's how it works. So as, as soon as the vapors try to go up, they actually are refluxed back into the system. It makes sure that the temperature stays approximately constant and it also in, ensures safety. It also ensures that we not, uh, actually face the vapors of the product or the reactant. 
So you can use this reaction to make a sample of ethanoic acid by heating ethanol with an excess of oxidizing agent in plus and dichromatic, which is some dilute hydrosulfuric acid with a condenser placed vertically on top. This is known as heating under reflux. It condenses any vapor so that it runs back into the flask and don't escape. When the reaction is complete, the condenser is rearranged for a simple distillation. Ethanoic acid and water are both distilled, so solution of ethanoic acid is actually collected. All right, so there is a difference of their boiling point. So yeah, you can distill them with the help of distillation. Now, moving on, <coughs> production of ethanol. <clears throat> now, ethanol can be made by multiple sources. I was using the word fermentation before because I knew that is going to be a part of your book. So, fermentation is a common process by which we make ethanol. What do we do? Yeast, which is actually a type of fungi, these are living cells, <coughs> are added to sugar. They may be added to starch or any kind of solutions, fruit juices, juices from some grains, sugarcane, any of these can work. Now, they're left in warm about 30 degrees centigrade for several days in the absence of air, which, is, which are anaerobic conditions. Remember, when we are using the word anaerobic, it means we're not providing oxygen to the entire system. Enzymes, biological catalysts, which he says definitely, convert the sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide. The whole process is known as fermentation. Absence of air, temperature are both important. Why? Because the presence of air or aerobic condition or oxygen makes sure that the enzymes in yeast produce carbon dioxide and water instead of ethanol. So we're not going to get our product otherwise. Hence, anaerobic conditions are a must. The temperature has to be maintained. Why? Because enzymes are protein in nature. If the temperatures increase above 40 degrees centigrade, they lose their structure, they don't work any longer, and we use the word denatured for them. At a temperature lower, too low temperature, the reaction becomes too slow to proceed. So anywhere in between 30 to 40 degrees centigrade is actually the optimum, the best possible temperature for the reaction. Now, if we discuss the biochemistry for this one, this one is pretty complicated. The sucrose is first broken down into glucose and fructose, then the glucose is further broken down into ethanol and carbon dioxide. So we do try to go with this biochemistry. This is just for information. What you're gonna do is that you're gonna face this as a question in exam. So of course, the aqua solution of glucose is converted into ethanol and carbon dioxide, one of which is an aqua solution, the latter one is a gas. So the starting materials are glucose from sugarcane or from any of the fruit juices or any other sources. Uh, temperature is around 30, but you can take it as high as 40, but in between 30 and 40 is gonna be optimum temperature. The catalyst is actually the enzymes present in yeast. Other conditions, anaerobic, absence of air. Anaerobic means absence of air. If to be exact, you can you can call it absence of <coughs> oxygen. That's a better way to do it, right? Moving on, yeast is actually killed by uh, more than about 15% of alcohol. To be honest, alcohol actually can kill yeast. When alcohol is about 15%, it's good enough to kill all the yeast in the system, no matter how much of yeast is present. So it's impossible to make pure alcohol by fermentation, since that's as high as the reaction can go. So about 15% of that alcohol, uh, glucose is converted into alcohol and rest remains. So the alcohol is purified by fractional distillation and multiple distillations to be true. Let's take advantage of the difference in boiling point between ethanol and water. Water boils at 100, ethanol boils at 78 degrees centigrade. So yeah, with the help of fractional distillation, we can separate ethanol before we, can, uh, we actually boil water. So that's the first fraction that we get. It's also explained in chapter number two. So I hope this comes as a prerequisite knowledge. I do not need to explain it in detail. Now, we can also form ethanol by Fossil fuels, fossil fuels from cracking usually give us a paint. 
In previous chapters, we have talked about tracking bigger uh, genes or bigger molecules into smaller uh, uh, unsaturated molecules. One of them is ethene. So ethanol can be made by reacting ethene with steam. This is a process known as hydration. Remember, hydration means addition of water. Now you are adding water over here. To be specific, you are adding actually water in the form of steam over here. Why? Because the temperature required for this reaction is 300 degrees centigrade. And of course, all of the water is going to boil at that kind of temperature, hence steam. Remember, there is a G over here and not L. Since it's not in liquid form, it's in gaseous or steam form. The pressure is about 60 to 70 atmospheric. The catalyst is phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Only a small pro proportion of ethene reacts. The ethanol produced is condensed as a liquid and unreacted ethene is recycled through the process. So much so you, you can actually make sure that around 98 to 99% of the ethene reacts in the system. Even a higher efficiency can be seen. This is an addition reaction. <clears throat> How? Let's take a look. Ethene is formulated like this. Now you're going to add water, H2O. You may also write it as H combined with OH. All right? So I'm not going to write water. This I'm doing to make it easier for you. So H combines to one carbon atom and OH combines to the other. Breaking one of these bonds, what do you end up with? Carbon. Now these two hydrogens up top. And at the bottom, and this hydrogen comes at this side. Now these two hydrogen up top and at the bottom, and this OH can be written over here. We have the structure of ethanol. So it's actually a addition reaction. An entire molecule of water can be added to a doubly bonded compound after it is converted into a singly bonded one. Hence, addition reaction without removing anything. Of course, addition reaction usually results in one single product, and that's what happened over here. Now we're gonna compare both the methods. Since methods have their own advantages and disadvantages, so what I'm gonna do over here is that I am going to write A for every time if we can consider it as an advantage, and I'm gonna write a D if we can consider it as a disadvantage. This also works like pros and cons of a specific reaction. Now when we, <coughs> sorry, when we talk about fermentation and hydration side by side, the first thing that we come up with is use of free source. Now, fermentation uses a potentially renewable resource, sugar beet, sugar canes, corn, starchy materials. They can always be planted at the next year and we can get a new crop. So yeah, that comes as an advantage. So here, hydration of ethene is actually consuming a finite non-renewable resource. So once all the oil of the world has been consumed, you won't be able to go with this reaction anymore. So that comes as a disadvantage. Types of process. Fermentation is a batch process. Everything is mixed together in a reaction vessel, left for several days, the batch is then removed, a new reaction is set up. This is inefficient, a disadvantage. On the other hand, for hydration of ethene, it's a continuous flow process. A stream of reactants are constantly passed over the catalyst, and if some of it does not react, you actually recycle it on the, in the same reaction, which is much more efficient than a batch process. So hence that comes as an advantage. Now that the rate of the reaction, fermentation is slow. It takes several days for each batch. This comes as a disadvantage. Hydration of ethene, on the other hand, is a pretty quick method. You don't require days, a few minutes or a few hours, uh, to get started with this reaction are good enough. So that actually comes as an advantage. Quality of product. Now fermentation produces very impure ethanol which needs further processing and of course further fractional distillation, which comes as a disadvantage. On the other hand, hydration of ethene produces much purer ethanol which comes as an advantage. Reaction conditions. Fermentation uses gentle temperatures and atmospheric pressure. You do not need any sophisticated instruments. You can just put them up in bigger vessels and that's about it. 
So that's an advantage actually. But hydration of ethene, on the other hand, remember, it required approximately 300 degrees centigrade temperature. It required 60 to 70 atmospheric pressure, which is pretty high of a pressure and a high input of energy. So this requires sophisticated instrument, which comes as a disadvantage. It's, it's not going to be inexpensive to begin with this process in the first place. So yeah, you can see a few advantages and a few disadvantages of every process. So they are not going to ask you to write the whole table in there. They might ask you about the advantages or disadvantages of any one specific process. So I've written A's and D's so that you would know which specific process has what kind of advantages or disadvantages. And most of the time, that's how you're supposed to answer this question. At the moment, countries which have easy access to crude oil produce it with the hydration technique. But the countries which have easy access to ethanol, sugarcane, starch, the countries which have a larger uh, production to uh, agriculture, they actually uh, go for that one. So yeah, it depends from country to country what kind of resources they have and how they're going to go with that one. And this actually finalizes the chapter.